Good afternoon. I want to welcome everyone to this very special event today, which is part of a series of virtual briefings for members of parliament with the support of Wilderness Foundation Africa and ICCF. As always, a very special welcome to the honorable members and a big thank you to the chairperson of the Portfolio Committee on Environment, Forestry and Fisheries, the honorable Kaisa for hosting this briefing. Welcome also to everybody joining us via YouTube. I think it's quite a sizable audience today. I met Jane Goodall the first time in the late 1990s at a conference in Sun City, where she immediately became one of my heroes and role models. And so it's indeed an exceptional honor for me to welcome Dr. Jane Goodall here today. As I'm sure everybody knows, she first entered the Gumbe Forest at the young age of 26 to do groundbreaking research on chimpanzees. Since then, Dr. Goodall has spent her life in service of animals. She is the founder of the Jane Goodall Institute and also of the Roots and Shoots Global Program that empowers young people in nearly 60 countries, many in the developing world. And I know there's also a very active one here in South Africa. And that program has greatly impacted youth in over 100 countries to become the conservation leaders of the future. Now, before COVID, and I'm sure she will return to that soon, she traveled for more than 300 days a year. Think about that, 300 days a year to speak to people around the world about the interconnectedness of all living things and the collective power of individual action. Above all, and what I find so special about her, is that in a world where it's so easy to feel despondent, especially when it comes to the environmental crisis we face, that she believes that there are reasons for hope. And I hope she will tell us today why. Jane, thank you so much for being with us. Um, we are truly honored. And we now give over to you for some initial remarks, after which we will have some questions and discussions with the MPs. Jane, over to you. Jane, are you there? Have we lost? You to me and you didn't unmute me, so. Oh, sorry about that, there we go. So let me start again by saying good morning to everybody, to the honorable members and to all the people who are listening in um, on YouTube or whatever. And especially my granddaughter, Angel, who sat right there in Cape Town and the members of the Jane Goodall Institute, South Africa and Roots and Shoots. So special friends. But I, I'm at the moment grounded here in the UK. Yes, I used to travel 300 days a year, not a very environmentally friendly way of living, but so many trees were being planted by roots and shoots that I think my carbon emissions were more than absorbed. But still, when I first was grounded at the beginning of this pandemic, I was frustrated and angry. And then I thought, well, that's no use. You know, we have to adapt. So we created a virtual Jane, and it's that virtual Jane who's speaking to you now, even though I'd much rather be there with you. Well, the pandemic that we're still battling with in many parts of the world, including the UK, has caused so much suffering, loss of life, loss of jobs and livelihoods, and it's caused economic chaos around the planet everywhere. And the tragedy is we brought this on ourselves by our disrespect of nature and our disrespect of animals. So as we destroy habitats and move ever deeper into animals' homes, so we force some of them into ever closer contact with people. And in addition, we hunt them, kill them, eat them, we capture them and traffic them alive or their body parts around the world. We sell them for food or medicine in the wildlife markets of Asia, the bushmeat markets of Africa. And there's the very popular international trade in exotic animals as pets. A lot of this traveling, trafficking is illegal, but we also torture billions of animals in our factory farms as more and more people eat more and more meat. And in all of these situations, the wildlife markets, the, the factory farms, the pets that come into people's houses, we're creating an environment that makes it especially easy for a pathogen, in this case, a virus, to produce a new disease, to spill over 
from an animal host to a human when it bonds with cells in that human's body, as did COVID-19. So we get this very contagious pandemic. And so I, I want to come back to the topic of animals in a bit. But let me say, first of all, that as we move out of this pandemic, it, quite clearly it has for a while pushed aside the far greater threat to our future, to the future of all life on Earth, and that's climate change. And as I traveled around the world before this pandemic, I saw with my own eyes the devastating consequences of climate change, of changing weather patterns. I saw ice melting in Greenland. I met people who'd been driven from their island homes by rising tides as the sea warmed and as the glaciers around the planet melted. I've seen the devastating results of the storms, the hurricanes, the typhoons, and of the terrible flooding and the terrible droughts in many parts of Australia and Africa, and the fires that have been raging, that are still raging in California, the terrible uh, wildfires last year in Australia. For the first time in history, Britain history, there have been fires in the boreal forest up in the north. So this is a situation which we have brought upon ourselves again by our disrespect of nature. You know, it's, it's crazy, isn't it? From the chimpanzees, we learned that they are our closest living relatives. We share with them 98.6% of our DNA. And, um, sorry, I need to put this here. We, we share with them 68% uh, of, sorry, 98.6% of our DNA. So they are our closest living relatives. And the biggest difference they're way more intelligent than we used to think, but we've designed a rocket that went up to Mars and a robot crawled off and crawled around on the surface of Mars to take photographs. And at one time people thought that there might be life such as we know it up there and that maybe we could colonize it. But looking at those photographs, I don't think any of us would want to go and try and make a home there. How is it possible that the most intellectual creature that's ever walked this planet is destroying its only home? Because that's what we're doing. And we're destroying the rainforests, we're polluting the ocean, we're making inroads into just about every single environment that is on the planet. And it's completely mad to think that we can have unlimited economic development on a planet with finite natural resources of which we are using up some even now faster than nature can replenish them. And a planet uh, of, with growing human populations, 7.2 billion of us now predicted closer to 10 billion by 2050. So, as we emerge from this pandemic and confront this terrible threat of climate change, it's clear that we need to move towards a different relationship with the natural world, a different relationship with animals. And we need to get together to move towards a more sustainable, a greener economy. The good news is that we have the intellect that theoretically should enable us to do just that, because there are already amazing advances in technologies, the use of the sun, the wind, the tides, that will help us to move towards this different way of living. But it won't be easy because there are so many people, political leaders, business leaders, who just want to get back to business as usual. So, it's, we're, we're really at a crossroads, I believe. There is a window of time when if we get together, we can start healing some of the harm we've inflicted on the planet and at least 
reducing, uh, slowing down climate change. But it's going to be a battle, isn't it? And it's a battle that affects every single one of us, the outcome of that battle. And in particular, it affects those from future generations. But as I said, I want to go back for a moment to thinking about animals. When I was growing up, and I'm here in the home I grew up in, in Bournemouth in the south of England, I always loved animals. I was born loving animals and reading, determined to go to Africa and live with wild animals and write books about them. And I had that amazing opportunity of learning from not just any animal, but the one most closely related to us, the chimpanzee. Spent two years with them, realizing how similar we are in our behavior. Science was learning more and more about how similar we are biologically. And I was told I had to go to Cambridge and get a PhD. I hadn't even been to college. But my mentor, Dr. Lewis Leakey, known in Africa because he was a paleontologist who spent his life searching for the fossilized remains of early humans on the African continent. And he said, Jane, there's no time for an undergraduate degree. And so there I am arriving in Cambridge, very nervous, and being told by many of the professors that I'd done everything wrong. I shouldn't have given the chimpanzees names. That wasn't scientific. I couldn't talk about them having personalities or minds or emotions. Those were unique to us. But I had learned from my childhood friend, my dog Rusty, who's always sitting here behind me, that the professors were wrong. We're not the only beings on this planet with personalities, minds, and emotions. And gradually, as the detailed observations came in from Gombe National Park, where, by the way, we're still studying chimpanzees 60 years later and still learning new things. But my then husband, Hugo van Lauwek, his films went around the world. Science had to start thinking differently in a less reductionist way. And that opened, it, it broke down a barrier which science had erected between us and the rest of the animal kingdom, a non-existent barrier. But I was told the difference between us and other animals was one of kind, and actually, of course, its degree. And so science began to admit that, well, elephants and dolphins and all kinds of different animals have enormous intelligence, much greater than we ever used to think. And yes, they have emotions, and yes, they do have personalities. And one by one, different animals have been studied and new understanding has come from those studies. And one of the most recent ones, one of my most favorite ever documentaries, My Octopus Teacher by Craig Foster. I know you're there somewhere in Cape Town, Craig. At any rate, here we are and as I said earlier, we have been disrespecting animals. So all of those situations I mentioned, the hunting, killing, eating, trafficking, selling them in wildlife meat markets and bush meat markets, the exotic pet trade, the hunting, the trophy hunting, uh, each of those animals is not just, you know, harming us. And it's not just cruel in, in general, it's harming individual animals with their personalities, with their own lives, able to feel fear and pain. That makes it a little different. And while I'm on that subject, let me mention the growing trend for eating more and more meat and having billions and billions of farm animals in these crowded, often unhygienic conditions, which has led to zoonotic diseases, those that jump the species barrier. And it's not just that it can lead to disease, it's unbelievably destructive on the environment because the animals have to be fed, land is cleared to grow the grain, fossil fuel is used to get the grain to the animals, the animals to the abattoir, the meat to the table, water becoming scarce, and you know about that in Cape Town, I know. And 
an enormous amount of water is used to change vegetable to animal protein, just as an enormous amount of water is used to irrigate crops in land which wasn't designed to grow large amounts of vegetation. In addition, and finally, all these billions of animals produce methane gas in their digestion, a very virulent greenhouse gas. So as we tackle climate change, as we must, it's not just reducing emissions from fossil fuels, it's also reducing this methane gas, a large percentage of which is caused by animal agriculture. So thinking about animals having their own personality, you must all remember the huge uproar around the planet because Cecil the lion was shot by an American dentist using a, a, a bow and arrow or bow hunting or whatever it's called. And there was an outcry because he was a named known lion, just because he had a name just because somebody was studying his pride, doesn't mean all the other lions who are shot are different. And lions are not only shot to stick their heads on some rich person's wall, but they're in your country, in South Africa, they're being bred for hunting. Lions are becoming endangered. When I first went to Africa, I never thought that lions could be an endangered species. They were everywhere. When I went to the Serengeti Plains, you couldn't walk across the plains without bumping into a lion. So we're harming not only individual animals, we're harming the ecosystems where they live. We have a real problem, we're in the sixth great extinction. So we've made a mess of things. With our brilliant brains, we've made a mess of things. We're making decisions based on how will it benefit me now, or the economy of my country, or how will it benefit my next political campaign? How will it benefit the next shareholders meeting? We're not thinking of how the decisions we make today may affect future generations. Don't we care about our children and their children, our grandchildren? Of course we do. So how can we go on stealing their future? It was because I met many young people as I traveled around the world who seemed to have lost hope, who were depressed, angry, sometimes apathetic. And when I talked to them, they said, well, you've harmed our future. There's nothing we can do about it. Yes, indeed, we have harmed your future, but it's not true that there's nothing that can be done. We have a window of time. It's not just me saying that. Many other scientists also believe we have this window of time when if we get together, we can start healing the harm that we've inflicted. So I began this program, Roots and Shoots. It began in Tanzania, where the chimpanzee study still goes on. And it started with 12 high school students. It's now in um, 66 countries. It has been in more, but sometimes it fades away for a bit. So I'm talking about where there are active groups, hundreds of thousands of groups, preschool, kindergarten, university, everything in between, more adults forming groups. Main message, each one of us makes some impact on the planet every single day, and we can choose what sort of impact we make. And each group choosing three projects to make the world better, to help people, to help animals, to help the environment working on the problem of plastic pollution, working on planting trees to try and absorb more CO2 from the atmosphere, working in shelters and sanctuaries, sanctuary for orphan chimpanzees, such as the Jane Goodall Institute one uh, near Nelspray, Chip Eden, rescuing chimpanzee orphans whose mothers have been shot often for bushmeat, sometimes for trade, exotic, pets. So Roots and Shoots is one of my greatest reasons for hope. Everywhere I used to go, there were young people wanting to tell Dr. Jane what they've been doing to make this a better world. And they're changing the world. There's no question about that. They are making major change. Last year alone, in 2019, Roots and Shoots groups between them planted five million trees. And 
so the next reason for hope, I've already mentioned it, this amazing intellect that we have. And we're coming up with the most amazing, innovative technologies that will help us live in greater harmony with nature. We just need governments to sponsor clean, green energy and not have this, this close, cozy relationship with the old boys network, the oil and gas industry and other extractive industries. We do care about the future. We need to change. My next reason for hope, the resilience of nature. I mean, my goodness, I've known places and you must have known places that we absolutely destroyed for some reason. One, And given time, maybe some help, nature will reclaim them. Maybe not quite as it was, but nature will return. At one time, Little Gombe National Park in Tanzania was part of a great forest that stretched to the West Coast. By 1990, it was just an island of trees surrounded by bare hills. More people living there than the land could support, too poor to buy food elsewhere. And that's when it hit me. If we don't help people find ways of living without destroying the environment, without cutting down the last trees, fishing the last fish in their desperate effort to feed themselves and their families, then we can't save nature. We can't save animals. But nature, as I say, is resilient. Animals on the brink of extinction can be given another chance. I've met them. I've met the people working on those projects. So those are my reasons for hope. And we can, if we get together, make change. We can leave behind us a planet which is less devastated than it is now. But we only have a window of time. I don't think it's very big. And at the moment, it's closing all the time. So the future is in our hands. It's up to us to help the young people to get together to make this a better world. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jane. Well, now, I am going to open the floor or the, I don't know, is it the floor when you're on Zoom? Whatever it is. <laughs> um, to questions from MPs. And I know I'm going to have a problem here now because usually, Jane, by this time, the questions pop up. But they always say in broadcasting that when your audience goes really quiet, it's because they're really listening, you know. So I know this is what's happening here. Can I just check from MPs, Honorable Winkler, I know that you said beforehand that you wanted to speak to her. Are you ready with a question? If you are, just unmute your mic. Yes, thank you. I'm here. Um, thank you for this amazing opportunity, Melania, and thank you for organizing this. Um, Dr. Jane Goodall, you're an absolute hero to so many of us. Um, thank you for this lifelong contribution you've made to the conservation of our planet and our most amazing and unique species. Um, what I'd like to ask is how do we bridge this chasm that exists uh, between those who believe that the preservation of our planet comes at a cost to economy and jobs. Um, there seems to be a complete reluctance to acknowledge that there will be no economy and there will be no flourishing unless we preserve what we have, which is not being sustainably used. Um, and it seems that I always come up against the same arguments that one requires a trade-off in another. Um, and it's so hard to break through this barrier um, to really convince people that it's in our best interest and in human flourishing to do this and to a growing sustainable economy. So perhaps some suggestions from your side, please. Thank you. Well, I think, I think uh, one of the reasons we come up against this barrier that you describe, which is so true, is that the people who are talking in the way you said, about, you know, we need to do this now. We need to be thinking of the bottom line. We can't afford to save this piece of the environment because we've got to have this economic development. But there, very often, those people who are wanting to acquire more power, more riches. And it, it's the same everywhere. It's all around the world. It's most unfortunate. And there, my hope lies in the young people 
that we began this Roots and Toots, and Roots and Toots is only one such youth group, although of course I think it's the best, but we began it in 1991. Many of our young people who joined then are now they're politicians, they're lawyers, they're teachers, they're parents, they're out in the adult world. And for some reason, they retain the values that they acquired during that program in school or university. And they're standing up in some cases to politicians who are corrupt and greedy and wanting to acquire power. You know, it was Mahatma Gandhi who said, the planet can provide for human need, but not human greed. And that's why I say we've somehow got together and work to change our attitude towards the natural world. And I think it's the energy and the commitment of young people who understand the problems, whose future is at stake, and providing they learn to work in the right way and not antagonize as long as they're not aggressive, slowly and surely with those of us who care behind them, they will create change. And the question always is, is there time? Yes, in the long run, but is there time? Because really we are so destroying the infrastructure of the planet as we destroy biodiversity. So I can't really answer that question, save to say that I, I Try and change people's minds by telling them stories, uh, not any other way. Thank you. Honorable Singh, I can see your hand is up. Uh, thank, thank, thank you very much indeed, Milani. And uh, what a pleasure it is to be interacting with somebody that I've been watching for many, many, many years as a young boy, watching these wonderful documentaries. And Ms. Goodall still looks as lovely as ever, <laughs> even today. Uh, it was one Miss Goodall, Milani, who said, the greatest danger to our future is apathy. You might have said this many years ago, but what do you find in the current scenario that we are in? Is this apathy still continuing or is there sufficient activism to allow people to understand the symbiotic relationship between man and animal? And what can be done more, particularly in areas where there's competition between wildlife and human beings, in rural areas, in farming areas, where there's destruction of crops, etc. What more can be done in this regard from your perspective? Thank you. Well, the answer is, is ridiculous because all I can really say is somehow we must solve those problems. I'm not a you know, I can't solve every problem that's thrown at me. I know what we ought to do, but I don't always know how we do it. But that's one of the advantages of this intellect that we have, which I believe was triggered by the fact that we developed a way of communication involving the use of words. We're talking with words now. And uh, in spite of language problems, we have interpreters now. So what we can do is to bring people together with different backgrounds, with different sets of skills, and we can discuss a problem. But we've got to be open to discussing the problem. We've got to admit the problem before we can bring people together to try to solve it. And I don't think it's really these huge conferences there's such a lot of words. I mean, the Paris Agreement, every country made a commitment, but they chose their own level of emission reduction. And I don't think any of them have actually, maybe one or two, lived up to their promise. And so words and promises without ways of enforcing those uh, don't, don't go anywhere. So again, I'm really, really thinking about and counting on the young people with their brains and their enthusiasm. The little boy in Kenya, when the lions, he was supposed to guard the cattle at night and the lions were coming in and killing them. And he designed this system of lights that flashed in different places. It was taken away from him, the system, and developed and somebody else got the glory. But it was this little 10-year-old Maasai boy 
who thought of it. And there are examples of young people, like the young American who's created this, I don't know what you call it, but this huge, like a boom that is dragged out around that Pacific uh, patch of plastic. And it's working and the plastic is being drawn in, not just the surface plastic, but down underneath. I saw a film about it the other day when I first heard about it, I thought this will never work, but it, it sort of is working. If it's backed up by different governments and people stopping the plastic from, from the land into the rivers where it goes into the ocean. So, you know, we to answer your question, each, each one of these problems is different. And the, the, um, the crop raiding, well, elephants, and I'm sure many of you know this, elephants can indeed devastate a poor little. It turns out they're terrified of bees. Well, bees seek out moisture. Can you imagine being an elephant and having bees up your trunk? Oh, it gives me nightmares. So there are people imaginatively putting just little wires around the crop field with hives of, of bees every so often. The elephant touches the wire, the bees buzz angrily, and the elephants move away. And the villagers can get money from the honey. So it, these are the imaginative ideas that, that young people have, that we can all have. But we must admit the problem. We must admit both sides and then try and find somewhere in the middle where humans and animals can live in better harmony. And there are solutions. I'm sure there are. Thank you. I, I know, um, Honourable Winkler, you can go again, but I just want to ask, we don't usually do this on YouTube that we allow the questions to pop in, but there's a few really interesting questions. So if people on YouTube wants to ask questions, pop them in. We, we are having a look at you there as well, and we can feed them through. Um, let me um, ask this one question, which is interesting. It says, um, please ask Dr. Goodall, do we need a new ethic a new story to take us into the future? And if so, what would it look like? Well, as I say, we do need this new story. We need this new way of interacting with the natural world, a new way of interacting with animals, a new, more sustainable, greener economy. And if, if we carry on with business as usual, that really spells, you know, it's not just other life forms that will become extinct as they have already. It's us too, because I've already said, but in some places we have used up the natural resources faster than nature can replenish them because the natural resources are finite. And that's why people are desperate to look for oil in the, in the Antarctic, for example, and under the ice. And it's, you know, the, the new clean, greener future is something we all have to get together and see what it would look like. And having seen what it can look like, which is greater harmony between humans and the natural world, because we're part of the natural world, we depend on it. Uh, let's dream what it looks like and then use our brains to work out together how we can achieve it. Honorable Winkler, go for it again. Thank you so much. And thank you for that beautiful response, Dr. Goodall. Um, it's very inspiring. Um, so my question is, we have a situation in South Africa with captive lion breeding, as you're well aware. And at the moment, um, our Minister of Environmental Affairs, Barbara Creasy, has appointed a high-level panel um, to assess the entire industry. Um, and then to, uh, the panel will recommend outcomes. A lot of the argumentation around um, having captive bred lions is that it takes pressure off of wild lion populations. Um, but there's actually evidence to the contrary, where it says that it's always cheaper to poach an animal in the wild than it is to legally procure one uh, through farming and then trophy hunting. Um, for the derivatives and their meat, etc. So, if you could perhaps, you know, speak to that and how I think the domestication of our wildlife is doesn't really have these conservation 
um, outcomes that are usually used uh, to justify and legitimize, uh, leg legitimize the practice. Um, and then in terms of this um, environmental ethic that needs to, I think, underpin the way that we interact with the world. Um, I do believe, and this is something that I was writing up in my master's, is that um, the current underpinning is uh, very sort of outdated and antiquated, and it's, it's about dominion over the natural world as opposed to custodianship or stewardship. And this is something that's entrenched in sort of the, you know, the, the annals of history. Um, and it's, it's so difficult to fight against this mindset and to help this, this new ethic that young people are s struggling and fighting for to take root, especially in the older generation. So um, perhaps if you could also speak to that. Thank you. Okay. Well, first of all, this thing about dominion over, you know, the birds of the air and the beasts of the land and so on, it comes from Genesis. And I have many Jewish friends the word, the original word, which I call the original word is something more like stewardship. So that one verse in the Bible has led to this, this idea which took root. Why did it take root? It took root because it was convenient for us to think that the animals were there for us to use as we wish, but they're not. And they're part of this amazing tapestry of life. You know, I was so lucky. I could spend months alone in the rainforest, sometimes with the chimpanzees, sometimes with the other animals. And it was there that I learned about the interrelationship of all life in the rainforest and how each species, no matter how insignificant, has a role to play. And even though a small, seemingly insignificant species becomes extinct, maybe it was the major food source of another creature, and so on and so on. And there have been cases where losing just one small, seemingly insignificant species led to total ecosystem collapse. So everything is interrelated on this planet. And to go back to the, to the situation of the wildlife and the farming and the trophy hunting and the money, there's been uh, recently, and I should have, have it in my mind, but I haven't, but a man has spent many, many years researching trophy hunting, not just in, in, um, in Africa, but America as well. And although the argument is, well, it benefits conservation because the hunters pay the money, and conservation benefits, usually that isn't the case. Uh, the money doesn't really get to the people who are fighting for conservation. It doesn't get to the poor villagers, only a little bit of it, and the rest goes into somebody's pocket, usually the outfitter. And then again, come back to the fact that these animals are individuals. What right do we have? If we really step back from this pedestal we put ourselves on, we're just one of many. And we've developed this intellect which enables us to destroy the planet. It enables us to change the planet in ways that we think will benefit us. And it's usually will benefit me and my group rather than will benefit future generations. And so, if we start thinking differently, how do we overcome the, the barrier of people who think differently? We have to remember that they're thinking differently because they want to benefit themselves or their group. And the young people are beginning to understand. I wish environmental education and ethics was part of every school curriculum because I think you know, once young people understand the problems and they have some education, they changed and they really want to move forward and create this better world. But, you know, it's so important not to be aggressive, not to be violent. And as I said, for me, telling stories, because nobody, no powerful politician is going to listen to some young person telling them that they're bad and they should do things differently. No, you have to have change from within. 
And the only way I know to change people, and I have made it work sometimes, is telling stories reaching the heart. You have to reach the heart. And you may not realize that you've actually made a difference, but perhaps later you find out, yes, I did. This person began to think in ways he hadn't thought before, just because you managed to reach the heart. And there's another thing when we come to big corporations, uh, consumer pressure works. So if you think a company is harming the environment or being cruel, or is making use of child slave labor or something like that, don't buy their products. It's begun to work. And I know many companies have changed course because of consumer pressure. If they want to keep going, they've got to make their products in a way that satisfies their customers. Otherwise they go bankrupt and it can change politics as well. Honorable Holomisa. Thank you, Chairperson. Uh, what an excellent presentation. We are so thankful. The issue of uh, wildlife, it depends on uh, political will in each and every country. I remember when I was the Deputy Minister of uh, Tourism and, and Environment in 1995, 94, 95, 96, it, it, uh, at the Kruger National Park, the South African government at the time was culling uh, the, 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 the elephant. And then uh, I made an arrangement with the uh, International Fund for Welfare Animals, that was called IFO. Mm. Uh, we managed to relocate, stop culling first, and then we relocated a number of uh, wild, uh, wildlife uh, animals, in particular the elephant, to Ajo uh, in, in the Eastern Cape. Today, uh, recently I visited the area and uh, I was so happy to see that uh, the animals there have grown and that flock is increasing yearly. Uh, but what I wanted to share with you is that uh, the wildlife animals, uh, if it is true that COVID was started by the people who ate, who ate some of the kind of wild animals. So we need to be careful as a country and if possible, this task team by the Minister of Environment Affairs should also include the Department of Health and of course, Tourism Department. Lastly, I wish to introduce to my colleagues if they, they are not aware. At Ado, they are busy now building, a, a, they want to build an Ado a, a, co, a co bridge, a bridge which will carry the animals across the railway line and the, the highway, the aim being that uh, if the, the, the animals wants to move to the other side of the, 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 the park, they should do so, uh, especially if they are looking for such things as water. So <clears throat> lastly, I think uh, the issue of uh, wildlife in general, we may have to consider having a big indaba in this country and say, how do we manage this uh, resource to make sure that uh, one, those who are calling for sustainable development, how are they monitored? Those who say they don't want to uh, see anybody eating animal, wildlife animals, how are we going to uh, deal with that because I foresee that there's going to be a confrontation and also remember that we are the signatories to the sustainable development I and mean, a sustainable development convention so let's take this let's continue with this debate but I also heard some members that there are some people who wants to 
uh, that we should use our apertures to share slaughtering of uh, uh, cattle and also some wildlife. I hope that will not be possible. Thank you. Thank you. Jane, do you want to comment on any of that? Well, yes, because, you know, some very important points there. And the bridge, bridges have been created in some of the Canadian national parks and they work. The animals use them. And uh, tunnels in, in the UK, oh. we have tunnels uh, going underneath busy roads and the animals learn to use them. And we have our young people, volunteers, who go and direct. There's a big crossing for toads of one road and many toads used to get squashed on their way to their breeding ground. And now they're all directed to go into these tunnels. So, you know, these are the kind of imaginative solutions. And one incredibly important thing, if we want to preserve wildlife, which we do, I imagine everybody listening does, uh, these wildlife corridors, so not just the bridges and the tunnels, but corridors, leafy corridors, which enable animals to move from one area to another, where they'll be safe, and areas which do not take them across people's farms. So in many cases, the old migration routes of animals have been compromised, and villages have grown up and villages have grown crops. So it's not surprising that the animals are using those crops. And it's not surprising that animals whose own environment is being increasingly destroyed are pushed to crop raid. I mean, you've got your baboons in South Africa, in Cape Town, being big in the news recently, you know, that are moving out from their forest. There was a, a young a group of roots and shoots in Tanzania, way out in some little village. And there, the farmers were angry at the baboons who were raiding their crops. So these children, they got, they were 10, 12, uh, 10, 12 years old, and there were about 15 of them. So they took it in turns to shoo the, the baboons away from the fields. Meanwhile, the farmers in anger, wanting to retaliate, were burning some of the baboon habitat. Well, of course, that made the baboons even more desperate to find enough food. So the children were going around the farmers, talking to them about the, the situation. And meanwhile, they were gathering up seeds of the wild foods of the baboons and planting them and reforesting the area with the suitable food for baboons so that they didn't feel so forced to crop raid and scaring them away, shooting guns in the air so that this tradition of crop raiding could be broken because animals have traditions and one starts crop raiding and then it becomes a tradition. You've got to break that tradition just as we have to break our own traditions in so many cases. And in a way, it's a fascinating challenge how do we solve these problems? How do we solve these conflicts between people and animals? We just need to get together and find imaginative ways that work for both and for the future. Um, Honorable Mbata, I can see you. I'm just quickly going to pop into questions for, that I'm getting from, from YouTube watchers. The first one is um, somebody who says, it's quite a long text, so I'm gonna just reduce it. She says, the um, last week in South Africa, we yet again saw the assassination of an environmental activist, a 62-year-old grandmother who was fighting for her village um, against some mines. And the question is, what more could politicians be doing to protect environmental activists in you? And then the second is, despite understanding the dangers of zoonotic diseases and COVID epidemic, the trade in wild animals continues. How do we address this danger of the wildlife trade? Um, and I know that, um, and I think what they're referring to is, I know there's been a push at the G20 to try and get a global ban on wildlife trade, in particular those who are being consumed. Um, and I presume the question is heading towards that way. And then after that, Honorable Mbata, I'll come to you. Well, um, that's two questions, isn't it? Yes. So what can governments do to protect activists? Um, 
please don't arrest them and throw them in jail. I think uh, allowing activists, uh, giving them a voice, listening to them, uh, maybe their protests are valid, maybe they're not, but at least discuss. I mean, that's the whole point of democracy. And sadly, in so many places, democracy is crumbling away in some of the most powerful countries on the planet. Uh, well, hmm. We have one very interesting election today, don't we? Uh, <laughs> anyway, uh, so politicians, well, they can do a lot to protect activists. And also we need to educate activists so that they don't act in ways that cause damage to innocent people and property. And that's important too. So we work on the two sides of it and have the activists also let them be properly educated so that they really know what they're talking about. Because so often somebody joins a group and they honestly don't actually understand what they're protesting about, what it means. And so that's, that's, that's just because they want to, I don't know, be prominent. And then the other part of the question, the um, trade in exotic animals and the wildlife markets. Well, I think if people are like eating chimpanzee meat in Africa and gorilla meat, that led to HIV AIDS, that led to Ebola. And think of the horrible consequences of those two diseases, um, particularly HIV AIDS, which is still with us. I know it was devastating in South Africa. And so China did immediately ban the selling of wild animals for food and moving towards banning the use of uh, things like bear bile and pangolin scales for traditional Chinese medicine and other Asian countries are following suit. So, but again, you can't just say let's ban it, let's ban the, the wildlife farming for food or whatever for skins without thinking of the people who are making a living now from doing just that. So we have to think of them as well. What can they do to stay alive if their livelihood is taken away from them like that? So there's always one solution leads to another problem. That's what we're facing today. That's why it's so difficult. But at least we can start moving in the right direction. I mean, we have to move rather fast because a lot of animals are becoming extinct and more zoonotic diseases are being created every single year by our disrespect of animals. That's uh, what the scientists are saying. Honorable Mbata. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Cheng. Uh, I've learned a lot today, but I just want to raise something that the main cause of um, our problem is urbanization because urbanization it, it it moves the community towards the the areas where animals uh, are, are free to stay because not only in the rural areas look at the um, the the areas where it's 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 urbanized you'll find the wild animal walking around and being confused because he sees the, the houses, he sees the people, people are scared of, of the animal and, and the, also the animal is scared of, of them. We've seen that in some instances it's happening. So one of the problems is urbanization because it's also uh, uh, pollute our environment because this, you find that they are using different types of, of, of uh, uh, um, uh, um, what you what you call a mode of 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 cooking? Like they use gas, they use coal, they use sulfur, so it affects the the the, the environment. Then the other thing is the the issue of lion breeding. Yes, it's a serious problem in South Africa. But um, how best can we change a uh, uh, behavior of our communities so that they understand the danger when these people uh, donate the, the lion meat to them. That they know that the meat uh, must be inspected by the meat inspector. 
it must be slaughtered properly. It must, must have a stamp to show that it has been inspected. And these are the dangers that needs to be, to be, to be done because uh, that's where we need to put more environmental awareness. And in most cases, when it's being done, it's top-down approach. And that won't change uh, the behavior. But, it's if, but if it's a uh, bottom up, the community tends to buy in and they, they change the behavior. Then I, I don't know how, how, how best, but it, it, it depends not only, uh, uh, it doesn't lie with the Department of Environmental Affairs, it lies with all departments and, and private sector including the community and the NGOs in order to, 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 to make sure that we, the behavior is properly changed and the, our community are protected. And they must know that uh, when somebody, because remember some of these uh, wild animals meet, they're, 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 uh, they're being uh, stolen from these areas and being slaughtered and being uh, so, sold to the communities who doesn't know. And also they, that's where we need to put more emphasis on, on so that they know that they don't just buy meat anywhere. In, within the townships, even the rural areas, there, there must be that thing. And the other thing that I want to, 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 to say, to, to, to comment lastly, is the issue of um, uh, how we can help that our environment is not affected. I think one of the, the issues is uh, it's agriculture. If we can uh, 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 do farming, but we look at uh, our pesticides and our chemicals that they are uh, environmentally uh, friendly. They don't affect the, 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 the environment. But uh, let's also look at the people that are dealing, that are using these wild animals uh, products. We have, People, they've been there for years. I always say that the traditional health practitioners, they use this, the, the, this uh, wild animals and uh, um, uh, parts or, or whatsoever for their own uh, traditional medicine. Let's have a close uh, relationship with them, educate them to say, when we are trying to heal your, 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 your patients, but also look at the danger that, must that might expose them further. Thank you. Well, that was an awful lot of information, but let me pick on uh, one piece that maybe I can say something useful. And that's about raising the awareness and the education of local communities. And I mentioned that the little Gombe National Park, which had been part of a great forest, uh, over the years was reduced to an island of, of forest, the tiny little park itself, surrounded by bare hills. So in 1994, JGI, the Jane Goodall Institute, we began a program, it was one of the first of its kind, our method of community-based conservation, and we call it Take Care or Takari. And Takari began by not a bunch of arrogant white people walking into the 12 very poor villages around Gombe National Park, but uh, seven local people selected because they'd worked in NGOs and forestry, education, health, and so on. And they went into the villages and sat down and listened to the problems. And then they asked the villagers, you know, what do you think we can do that will help you most? So we started, wanted to grow more food, which may, meant returning fertility to the overused farmland. And without using pesticides, without using these poisons that are destroying the soil around the world right now and have to be eliminated. And then they wanted better health and education. So we only had a tiny amount of money. We worked with the Tanzanian local authorities uh, to improve the, or sometimes build clinics and uh, improve the schools. So we started there and then the people came to trust us. We weren't like the others. 
and we could start water management programs because as they cut down the trees on the really steep slopes, there was terrible soil erosion and then the little streams were getting silted up and the fish were disappearing. So we started that and then we provided scholarships to keep girls in school during and after puberty. Uh, we couldn't provide many to start with, but gradually we're getting money to, to provide more. And we provided family planning information for the women, not delivered by us, although we held workshops, delivered by the local people themselves. And so microcredit based on Muhammad Yunus's Grameen Bank enabled groups of women, mostly women, some men sometimes, but mostly women to take out tiny loans to start their own environmentally sustainable um, business like getting some, some chickens and selling the eggs or having a tree nursery or something like that. And then finally, uh, as we began moving into other villages with this program throughout the Chimp Range in uh, Tanzania, now in 104 villages, by the way, and each of these villages provided one or two volunteers who learned how to use smartphones and as most wild chimps are in village forest reserves in this area, uh, this was very valuable. So they took their smartphones and they measured, you know, illegally cut trees, animal traps, sighting of a chimp or a pangolin or something. That all got uploaded into the cloud so it became transparent what was going on in these areas. And the people during this came to understand which i think they understood before but it was pushed aside by their desperate necessity to live the fact that preserving the environment is not just for wildlife it's for their own future and that the animals living in it make up this biodiversity which creates the healthy ecosystem and of course there's many facts about that so this program has created uh partners in conservation, where before the people were enemies of conservation. And we've initiated that in six other African countries around chimpanzee habitat. So, you know, that's that's one way. And, and raising the awareness of the villages and every school, there's roots and shoots, helping the children understand the different animals and how we need to get along with them in the environment. Thank you so much. Unfortunately, we've started to run out of time. I know also that Dr. Goodall has got back-to-back -back, um, YouTube meetings. Um, I just want to pass over um, to the chairperson of the portfolio committee to say a few words, and then I'll close the meeting after that. Uh, chairperson. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Melanie, for facilitating uh, the session. And thank you very much as well for bringing the good doctor. Excellent presentation, relaxed stories, and uh, it's good to uh, listen to somebody who has gone, you know, throughout the world to witness some of the things. So we, I think we have learned a lot from this session. But equally, let me thank the members of parliament for attending the session. And the sessions themselves are very good in that uh, they are helping us to, as public representatives, to be more open about issues. And when we are called upon to take decisions, maybe I can promise the good doctor to say from now some of those people he might have she might have what we were talking about and lastly the clear responses to the questions that have been raised today we also had a session with the high level appointed by the minister in the country these issues that we are talking about so thank you very much for the session. And I hope uh, from now on, our engagement with the executive, our engagement with the public 
is going to be an engagement of people who are informed, not just people who are asking questions. Questions that come from people who have got responsibility. Uh, because the doctor could say you would always have, uh, if you have got one view, you must juxtapose that view to the other views that might be different from what you are expecting. Otherwise, thank you very much for the session and for the other sessions on your part, uh, Melanie. Uh, I think the crop of the members of parliament for this term are quickly getting up to the task that is confronting them, uh, especially after COVID-19. Otherwise, thank you very much. We, we have learned a lot. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chairperson. Well, sadly, we've come to the end of today's briefing. I'm sure we could have gone for another couple of hours and sorry that we couldn't take more questions off YouTube. Thank you to the Chairperson. Um, thank you to members of Parliament and to everybody who joined us on YouTube. But above all, thank you to you, Jane, for being, being with us. Um, I know this event will not easily be forgotten and I know it will serve as an inspiration to the, to, to the MPs who were with us today the MPs who are entrusted to protect the environment and the animals of our beloved country. Um, so thank you very, very much for, for your time and being with us. Um, just before we sign off, I should say that we're hoping to have one more briefing this year, some of the plastic issues. So we look forward to seeing everybody again soon. So stay safe and goodbye. And goodbye from me and thank you all. Goodbye, Doctor. Thanks for the excellent information. Thank you. And just remember, every one of us makes an impact on the planet every single day, and we can choose what sort of impact we make. Indeed.